Good morning, my sisters and brothers. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Now, we sometimes have readings in our lectionary that make you cock your head a little bit when you read them and go, hmm. Now, there are things that are going on in the text that many veteran pastors don't always want to deal with, much less an intern in preparation for ministry, like myself. And it might be simply easier to say, don't worry about that, you know? Or that's something that's really hard to deal with, and there's so much else that's in the text that you've read this morning. Why not just let it sit there? Leave it alone. Leave it for the professionals to deal with. So I have a choice to ramble on and dance around some of the harder issues in our reading, gloss over them, and pretend that they're not exactly there. And, you know, that knowing that my congregation is willing to look past them in sympathy and understanding for me, an intern still fresh in his vocation. But I have gotten to a point when reading text from scripture that I know to ignore things that might bother me or the people to whom I'm delivering a message doesn't really ignore them at all. Because it's going to be sitting there like a pink elephant in the room. And to say something from the text is too hard to preach from for myself and it's too hard for my congregation to deal with is not to give either me or you enough credit. So I can acknowledge that there's potential problems, and I can fervently hope that it's not like I'm dropping a big metaphorical bomb in the middle of the sanctuary, only to be dealing with the fallout afterwards at coffee hour when you come up to me and say, Vicar, what was that about? <laughs> Now, the reading from 2 Samuel is one of those passages. In it, we have the end of a story about David, who is the paragon of achievement from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He's the anointed king of all of Israel. He's been chosen by God himself to lead the people of Israel. And he's been praised for his righteousness and his dedication to the Lord. He's the ancestor of the family of Jesus. And so David... This wonderful paragon, in the heat of passion, makes a really bad decision. A bad decision that leads to him doing even worse things. Where he winds up betting a man's wife, a soldier under him, under his care, getting her pregnant, trying to cover it up by tricking her husband into betting her. And when that doesn't work, finds a way to get this man killed. Not with his own hands, but in kind of a passive way. Now David, David is actually a very good person. But, like all good men, he has the capacity of the worst behavior. He got caught up in his own self-importance. And one bad thing led to another. And he just couldn't stop himself. And denial is a very strong thing. And David just got completely caught up in it, in denial at this moment. Now the reading begins right after this soldier, Uriah, is killed in battle. And David takes his wife, who we know elsewhere as Bathsheba, into his own house as his wife. Now being the king that he is, David is not going to have people all over the place telling him, hey man, you did a bad thing, you need to fix that. You know, he's more likely to have people that are looking out for themselves, wanting to uh, curry favors with the king, wanting to do good things, not wanting to make the king mad at them by pointing out his own ill behavior. And so maybe, because David is a good person, and David has been recognized by the Lord, maybe there's guilt that he has that's eating him up. Maybe he can't sleep at night. We don't read about that. But whatever is going on in David's subconscious, it's not changing his attitude about what he did. And he's not changing his attitude about what he's going to do. And it takes a prophet, Nathan, really brave prophet if you ask me, because he doesn't know what's going to happen to him, to come in and say to David what needs to be said. An analogy about a rich man and a poor man and a sheep Enough to rile David up to break the cycle of denial and become remorseful, and the Lord puts away his sin and saves his life. Now, if the text ended there, it would sound nice, it would sound clean, a little story about unconditional forgiveness, 
wonderful, kind of antiseptic, if you ask me. But our text doesn't end there. There's a little bit more, and it starts with the end of Nathan's pronouncement. You see, after Nathan says, God has put away your sin, he says, nevertheless, because you have, by this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. There it is. Now, this is one of those passages in the gospel that many of us really wish wasn't there, sitting there. You know, one of those passages that when those of us of faith go out into the world and talk to people that aren't Christians, who point it out to us, they're like, well, you know, we don't like to talk about those things. And you have to wonder why God, God, surely... I know that David did all those horrible and awful things, but a baby? Come on. What did the baby ever do to anyone? It was just born, and it suffers because of what David did. But I can't ignore parts of the text that are inconvenient for me. I can't ignore parts of the text that relate to things that I don't want to talk about. And this passage about the faith of an innocent, princely babe in response to the sins of his royal father is no exception. Now, what is, what is innocence, anyway? What does it mean to say that this is wrong because one is innocent and couldn't have hurt anybody? But go ahead and take out retribution on somebody else. I mean, what if, what if this wasn't on the baby? What if God took away Bathsheba from David? I mean, he didn't really love her that much, so maybe that wasn't quite you know, what we're looking for. Maybe somebody else that David loved. She was innocent of David's crime, but surely she had some sin somewhere in the life, so she's not a purely innocent human being. And what, but what about Uriah's innocence? When David took everything from him and put him in a place where he would surely die. But also, to sit there and focus on the seemingly inappropriate response that God had to David's particularly awful sin, the consequences that David has to pay for them, it becomes very easy to overlook something else that's going on in this passage. If you leave off the story of David without this particularly uncomfortable consequence, you run the very significant risk of ignoring valuable truths that are in this reading. That God looks at the action of lords and kings and judges them even when they're able to take advantage of those who are in their care. The people that they are meant to protect. God looks at their actions without staying his hand. That God doesn't take kindly to people with power over others who walk with the air of righteousness but still do bad things. Or that this story conveys that good people do bad things and that bad things have consequences. And we don't get to choose the consequences. And the consequences are not always fair. And that consequences happen to people we love. And so the fact that it's an innocent baby, or any baby for that matter, took ill by the hands of the Lord is a huge stumbling block on what this narrative is really telling us. And so if that's what has our attention in this, then we're desperately ignoring the underlying and all-too-human tale of man, human, gone wrong. Because the people who originally read and wrote this story didn't think about it the way that we in the 21st century think about it. Those writers did not really think it was a particularly indifferent or evil act of God to take this child away. And so whether or not it was an interpretation of something that actually happened, no matter how you view this passage, whether it's literal truth or whether it's something, an explanation for a death of a child, the meaning of this passage is about sin and consequence. And just let it, leave it simply at forgiveness. To stop the reading where, David tells, where Nathan tells David his sin is put away, to overlook the fact that there were very serious and deadly consequences is to cheapen exactly the value of that forgiveness that he has been given. What it means and the value and its undeniable worth. 
When we sin, there are consequences. The consequences are not always apparent for everybody, but they are there. If you shoplift, you might not get caught. And some people that get caught don't suffer those consequences. They know people. Some other people get harsher sentences. Some other people get worse crimes. And we don't know why somebody's shoplifting. I mean, maybe they're, they're compulsive. Maybe they're cheap. Maybe they're trying to feed their family. But justice and rationale don't equal each other. But there are consequences. Whether or not somebody gets arrested, store security gets tighter. The prices of things get up. The next person that walks in that store that looks like you is going to be scrutinized a little bit harder than everyone else. When people break the law, they get in trouble. They get arrested. Or they serve in some other capacity. Their families might suffer. The law is often unfair. And criminal justice is applied to certain groups of people far more than it is to others. And it's a cascading effect. Which means that a lot of people that deserve to serve time often don't. And a lot of people that are serving time are often serving unfair amounts of it. Now, I was listening to San Francisco District Attorney Gascon on NPR, on, not NPR, sorry, on KQED on Wednesday. And he was talking about crime. And one of the things he said struck me really, really intently. Our laws are not designed for the safety of the public. Meaning that they are designed as knee-jerk responses to specific issues. The louder that the citizens are, the more likely that well, their concerns are going to become law. So people who are not in power don't often have laws that actually help them. They're designed to address certain things in the community. They're not designed to motivate people to get better. They're not designed to motivate people to change the way people behave. And what we have is a lot of people caught up in a system that is neither making them or society any better. And it becomes easy for those of us that aren't in the system. Those of us who have never had to serve time. To justify ourselves time and time again. Because life is hard for the rest of us. Life is hard for those of us. I mean, some of us living, I'm living, we're, me and my partner are living on one income. You know, we have to budget ourselves. You know, things aren't always that easy for us. Sometimes we can't afford to do things that other people are doing. It's hard. And I try my best to obey the law. I think I do a pretty good job. You know, there's always little things that many of us do that involve traffic or accounting or the occasional illicit substances that really aren't likely to put us in the hands of the authorities. But following the law doesn't make us good people. Any more than breaking it makes us bad. Good people do bad things. And bad people can, bad things, sorry, bad things can pile up and become worse things. And people can get caught up in the system and not get out. Life can start off with bad circumstances, bad decisions, bad experiences, and just get worse. But in a system that is so horribly broken, in a legal system, because law-based systems do not take every situation into account. Cannot take every particularity into account. Don't these people still deserve grace and forgiveness? Thank God that forgiveness is without limit. Because the human capacity to forgive is often found wanting. Thank God that His grace is limitless. Consequences can be circumstantial. They can be slippery. They can be frequently unfair. God's forgiveness is never conditional. Always available, no matter what our circumstances are. When a notorious sinner comes in off the street where Jesus is eating, and Simon the Pharisee complains about the way she dotes on him, and no less a little embarrassed because he hasn't been the best of hosts. Jesus gives Simon and his guests 
a clear parable about the size of loves of debtor, the size of love that debtors have for the creditors, depending on the debt. That those who are forgiven love more. That those who are forgiven love more. Forgiven more love more. So the size of someone's consequences, the nature meted out by the justice system, has no correlation on their deservedness of God's grace. Because God's grace, God's forgiveness, is limitless. The forgiveness given to us on our salvation, when God suffered on the cross, when God defeated death for us, was in order to redeem all mankind, not just those of us who are getting by, trying to do the right thing, following the law. It's for all of us. And we often have to live with the consequences of our behavior, our sins. Sometimes our consequences are minor, and we forget about them as the months pass. Sometimes the scars that we leave are lifelong and go past our death on our families. How can we, each and every one of us a sinner, Judge the merits and deservedness of another's redemption. What if we could, as Christians, always look on another sinner, no matter how often, and realize that no matter the consequences that they are paying in this life, no matter that the judgments that have been bestowed upon them, that man is putting them through, that God forgives them. How could it be if we could look at other people People who have done the worst of crimes look at them and say, God still forgives them. Where the justice system in society is broken, doesn't it become incumbent on each of us to offer that relief and that comfort, knowing that God does? No matter what the consequences of our sins, no matter the bad things that can happen to us as a direct result of the things that we do, or the bad things that happen to others, those who are innocent of our trespasses, God's forgiveness is complete. Levels of innocence become meaningless when all guilt is forgiven. Levels of innocence become meaningless. The love of God is abounding. And grace, grace is not cheap because Christ paid. But the grace of God by his purchase is worth beyond all understanding. And no matter the price that we pay for our, for the, in the consequences of our sins on earth, the valuable forgiveness that God offers us above all is unconditional and free. Amen. Amen.